Reports.net is a really powerful job scheduling framework that we have access to in the .NET ecosystem. But how do we go about parameterizing the jobs that we can go create? Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to walk through several different ways that we can pass data into jobs, including with dependency injection. Now, if you haven't seen my previous videos on Quartz.net, I'll put a link up here. You can go check that out to walk you through the basics of getting everything set up inside of an ASP.NET Core application with SQLite, and you can go change that to different providers if you don't want SQLite. In this video, we'll look at a handful of different ways that we can pass data into the jobs that we create, and I'll finish it all off with dependency injection. If that sounds interesting. Remember to subscribe to the channel and check out my pinned comment for those courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and check out Quartz. Okay, so the job that I've created is the same one that I'm going to have used in the previous videos. It's a very simple one. It just says, hello world. What happens if we want to start passing data into this job so that it's not just printing hello world with this hard-coded string right here? What if we wanted this to be configurable? The first way that we're going to look at is passing things in on the job data context. The way that this looks is that we can ask the context of this job execution context up top. We'll ask the job detail to get the job data map, and then we're going to get the parameter that we want. I'm just calling it message in this case, but you'll see context, job detail, job data map, and then getting the key so that we can ask for the value, right? So message from job detail, I can go ahead and pass that in here. Let's do it this way though. I'm going to make this so that we have a string interpolation here, copilot, maybe. Nope, okay, job detail. We'll do this and then I'm going to pass it in. Thanks, Copilot, for saving the day at the end there. We'll print this out. I'm still going to use a completed task here. None of this is done asynchronously. It's all uh, sync API calls. But now that we have this, we actually have to pass the data in, right? This is just going to be pulling the data out, but we haven't put anything into it. So we scroll up a little bit higher. We can see that when we're creating this job detail, this is a spot that we can pass in something to the job data. So if I go ahead and uncomment this, by the way, you might notice in my videos, I hide things in comments. So if you see little comments littered around, it's probably a spoiler alert for something cool coming later. In this case, it's going to be passing data in to these different things. So on the job detail, we can set job data with this job data map sort of like a dictionary, and then we can pass this information in. Before we move on, this is just a quick reminder that I do have a course on C-sharp refactoring available on Dome Train. Refactoring is one of the most critical skills that you can learn as a software engineer, and this helps you continue to build upon applications that already exist, making sure that they can scale and have extensibility. I walk you through a bunch of various techniques and give you some examples that we walk through together to see how we can apply these techniques to refactor the code. Check out the pinned comment and the links in the description to get this course. Now back to the video. When we go schedule this right below, we pass in the job detail and the job trigger. This job detail is configured to have this message. That means with this key, right? This is the same one we use all the way down here where we're getting that message. And just to kind of link it all together, we were setting the job detail, job data map message, not something else. Pay attention because this is going to be important as we go forward. If we go run this, we should be able to see this thing get printed to the console. And I'll pull it up here. There we go. Job detail message on job detail, right? So this is the little prefix I hard coded, and this is the parameter coming from the job detail. Now, there's another spot very much like the job detail, and that's going to be the job trigger. So you can do a very similar thing where we're going to use this job data. Well, I'm going to put it right here. We can combine both of these. I'll set job data still on the detail. I will set job data on the trigger as well. And that way, when we come down here, we can go add this as well to the console. Very similarly, right, we'll ask the context for the trigger, then we're going to get the job data map and then get the message off of that as well. You can use different keys for these things. I'm just keeping it consistent with message. And then I'm going to write that out to the console as well. Make sure not to have a copy paste mistake. And then I will say job trigger here. So now we can go run both of these together. If I pull the console up here, we should see that we get two console write lines. There we go, job detail and trigger as well, right? So there's two different ways that we can pass data in. Again, the trigger is separate from the job detail. These things are decoupled in quartz. So depending on where you want to align your data, you can still pass data into the job 
when it's running from both of these different things. Now, there's one more spot before jumping over to dependency injection that we can get more parameterized job options. So, I'm going to go look all the way back up at the top here when we're setting things up. When we're getting access to our scheduler off of the app and asking for it from a required service collection here, what we can do is set some context information. So on the scheduler, there is a context and we can go ahead and add sort of another key value pair, just like we saw in the other scenario. And that means that we can go pull this information off of the scheduler's context. So scheduler, detail, and trigger are all things that can pass data into the running job. You see what this looks like, very similar pattern right off of the context, we'll ask for the scheduler, then we're gonna ask for the scheduler's context and then we'll ask for the message. And maybe Copilot will auto-complete for us. Thank you very much, Copilot. If we go run this now, we should get three console write lines with three different strings. And there is the console running. And there we go, three different ones, job detail, trigger, and scheduler. Right, so three different ways for different use cases of passing data in. Keep in mind that the scheduler is going to be able to have that context available for every job and trigger that are done through that scheduler, right? So you want to think about it kind of like a hierarchy for who has access to what. So if you want all of the triggers and jobs that are done through that scheduler to have access to things on this context, that's where you're going to want to put that information. We've seen three different ways to pass things into here. But what about dependency injection? This is one final thing that I want to look at for this example. So if we look at our test job, it's not taking in any dependencies, right? There's no services or anything fancy being passed in. There's just parameters that we're having from either these three things that we just saw. What I'm going to do is add a primary constructor here. It's going to pass in a dependency called dependency. So I'm not very creative, but this is going to be the thing that we're passing in. I have it hidden again in plain sight. And here it is. It's not very exciting, but it's just going to be something that calls console write line. And before we run it, it's going to say this is the dependency. So just to keep the theme of everything going here, that means if I take this dependency and replace the console write line, what we're doing is we're using a passed in little dependency, this service that's passed in for us. This will get done through dependency injection. And if I scroll back up, we can thank all of this setup here off of the ASP.NET Core web app using this pattern because we're going to be able to use the iService provider that's available to our application. So as long as we register the service onto our dependency collection, we should be able to access it. We haven't done that yet, so there's still one more step. If I go ahead and take this, uncomment it, right? Before we go build the application, we'll add a singleton for our dependency. Now we should be able to resolve it, which means if we go all the way down here, when this test job has to get constructed by Quartz, it will know that it can ask the dependency container for this dependency, and that means we should be able to access it in here. Not only will we have data from three different spots, we'll also have a dependency passed in for us through the dependency injection framework. Let's go ahead and run this and see how it works. Here's the console, and we should see a bunch of noise, right? So every time it writes to the console, it says this is the dependency. So just sort of proving that we had this extra thing passed in through the dependency injection framework along with the three different types of parameters. As we can see, Quartz is a really powerful and flexible job scheduling framework, and I'm personally using it in my own side projects. As I'm building out my service, Brand Ghost, I'm able to leverage Quartz for different things related to social media posts and different types of interactions. So I'm leveraging it that way to create a content schedule or a, a cadence for posting social media content, and there's so much that you can do with it. I'm sort of just scratching the surface as I start to build out Brand Ghost with it. Now, there are competitor frameworks like Hangfire that allow you to do job scheduling. I personally haven't gone and explored those yet because Quartz does everything and more that I need for Brand Ghost. So you might want to check those out if you're looking for more capabilities that Quartz does not have. I hope you found this useful. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.